It's not what I'm talking about tonight, but one of the saddest things for me as a pastor is people who never get beyond the religion to the relationship because he's such a good father and he's so real and you can really know him as your father. And really so many things we've been talking about over the last month or so on Wednesday nights about, you know, you finding out who you really are and having the courage to embrace who God made you. It doesn't matter how you stack up to anybody else. We talked last week about David. How many of you know in the natural, he didn't stack up to Goliath? But what even he perceived to be a weakness, his size, his lack of armor, his, you know, uh, his age turned out to be the very instrument God used to get him close enough to sling that stone that God put his super behind and took that giant down. What is my point? God made you very special. He made you with unique gifts and graces and abilities. And it doesn't matter what it looks like in the eyes of the world. Reality is it doesn't even matter what it looks like to you. If he said you can do something, you can do it. If he's put a dream in your heart, he, you can achieve it. You can fulfill it. God would not put a dream in there that could not come to pass. And from his place in a timeless realm, he looks ahead. And if he tells you to do something, it's because you can do something. It's because he's already seen you do it. If he says you can, you can. Oh, my goodness. He is such a good father. You guys, he's really been showing out in my life. Someday I'll tell you the whole big story. But he's been showing out for me, and I'm just so grateful. You know, Pastor Mark and I went to the beach last week, and where we go uh, to rest and pray, th there's dolphins that usually have been coming. Every evening they go a certain direction. I don't know. they got some place down there they can hide and rest. I don't know what they're doing, but uh, they, they seem to head a certain direction. And there's a certain restaurant that uh, we go to that we can sit outside on an inlet, and there's always dolphins out there. But the last few years, I haven't seen any, none, zip, zero, no dolphins at all. And I look forward to it every year because I'm a big nature person. And so this just um, <clears throat> last week, I looked and looked and we even went to the restaurant and sat outside and there was no dolphins. And I look every evening and there was no dolphins. And, and, and I just kind of said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I'd really like to see a dolphin. Do you think you could arrange for me to see a dolphin? There's got to be a dolphin out there in the Gulf somewhere that you could have swim by just for me. And uh, so I didn't see one. I didn't see one. And we're getting ready to leave Saturday morning. And I had set my alarm for 9 o'clock because I, I do my best praying at night. And so I've been staying up really late in the night, sitting out on the balcony, just having wonderful communion with the Lord. And so I had, uh, was looking forward to sleeping in on my last day. I have to be truthful with you. So two and a half hours before my alarm goes off, my eyes pop open. And I'm like, are you serious? Uh, because, and, you know, when I wake up really awake, most of you know this from my BI classes, but that's usually God wanting to talk to me because I don't wake up easily. Matter of fact, I tell the story, you know, it wasn't that long ago, Pastor Mark came, it wasn't that long ago, Pastor Mark came in in the middle of the night and I was asleep. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, through my sleep fogged brain, I became aware that there was a man in my bedroom. Uh, and I'm thinking, you know, there's a man in my bedroom. And then I thought, what should I do? And uh, I thought, well, maybe I should introduce myself. This is the gospel truth. Uh, so I sat up in bed and I stuck out my hand and I said, hi, my name is Rhonda. And he, he's looking at me and he said, Rhonda, it's me. It's your husband. It's Mark, your husband. He said, oh, just lay down and go back to sleep. <laughs> Cause I was looking at him like, what? Uh, you know, in a crisis, I'd probably be serving somebody tea before I realized we had a a prowler in our house, but I don't wake up easily, I guess is my point. But Saturday morning, I woke up wide awake, and I thought, well, maybe the Lord wants to talk to me. So 
I, I went and got me a banana. And I sat outside uh, on the balcony to eat my banana and look at the ocean and talk to the Lord. And all of a sudden, I saw break the crest of the water was a dolphin. And I was like, ah. Oh. And then all of a sudden, a little further out, I saw another one. And then a little further out, I saw another one. And then the first one, he went this way a little bit, and he came back. They don't do that. He, he zigzagged in front of me for a few times, and I'm like, this is too good not to share. So I went, and I woke Pastor Mark up. And I said, you've got to come see this. And, and all told, in all sincerity, there had to be 20, 25 dolphins uh, at all different uh, depths of water, just swimming back and forth, uh, putting on the biggest show. The cleaning people were down cleaning out the pool, and the ladies like, I have never seen anything like this in my life. They're standing at the fence with their mouths hanging open. And I'm thinking, my God didn't just send me one. He didn't just send me five. He sent like 20 going back and forth right in front of our condo, making sure I saw him, making sure I was awake enough to realize what was going on. I mean, he put on a show. Oh, Pastor Rhonda, do you really think God did that for you? I absolutely know he did. He, I know he did. It's been a couple years since I've seen any off our balcony at all where we stay every time. But they went back and forth, put on the show for me. I was so grateful. I sat out there for two hours and watched them go back and forth. It was amazing. He's a good father. And you know what? You'll find who you truly are at his feet and in relationship with him. You can try to do and to be so many things. You know, we were praying one time about a particular man uh, who had, who used to be part of our church, but he had, he's um, moved away. And, but we were praying for him one day, and the Lord said to him, he's a self-made man. It wasn't my plan. And I thought, how sad. How many of you know you can do your own thing? You can make your own way in this world by your sweat, by your uh, hard work, by the gifts and the graces that he's given you. But how many of you know it's better to be a God-made man? It's better to be a God-made woman. You know, when you're in his presence and he whispers to you uh, the love that he has for you. And when he tells you, this is your destiny, my child. This is what I've created you to be and created you to do. There is nothing like it in the world. That's where you're going to find your purpose. That's where you're going to find your fulfillment. It doesn't matter whether anybody else thinks you can do the dream that God put in your heart or not. It doesn't even matter whether you're convinced you can do it. If he said you can, you can. And if he said you are, then you are. Embrace it. It is who I am. It is who I am. I don't know how, Lord. I don't know when, Lord. I don't know with whom, Lord. But I heard you speak, and I receive, and I embrace what you said about me, and it will be. It will be. Because he's a good father. He's a good father. Glory to God. Ephesians 2.10 out of the Amplified is where we're going to start tonight. For we are God's own handiwork. Ha ha. We're a piece of work. But we're God's piece of work. We are God's own handiwork, his workmanship. Recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew. That we may do those good works which God predestined or planned before for us. Taking paths which he prepared ahead of time. That we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. How many of you know your own dolphin show? That's a pretty good life. Glory to God. Just because you wished and you ask. Yeah, Pastor Rhonda, but you're a pastor. That ain't got nothing to do with nothing. It has to do with my father's heart. Him being such a good father 
And me having the courage not to just wish for a dolphin, but to ask the Lord. Could you rearrange? How many of you know in the scheme of everything God's got going on? Dolphins are not that big. You understand? I mean, we got that whole big mess in Washington. What's the Lord going to do with all them nuts? I don't know. Oh, did I say that? What's God going to do with all the elected officials that we so respect and have sent up there? I mean, he's looking over into Syria and, you know, all the mass killings and the suffering in the world today. But even as busy as my father is, he went out of his way for me Saturday morning. And I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. You know, sometimes we think God's got bigger fish to fry than me. And how many of you know he does? But he is so good at what he does. He can take care of them and Syria and you and dolphins all at the same time. He's pretty amazing. So I want us to personalize this scripture and say it over ourselves. Are you ready? For I am, I want you to say it with me loud enough that you can hear yourself, all right? For I am God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that I may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for me. He, wait, let's stop. He planned beforehand for you. He knew you before your mama knew you were in there. And he had a plan for you. He had a path that he laid out before you. He made preparation for your life before ever you were. I want to tell you some stuff, but I don't, I, I hesitate to do it because I don't want you to think, oh, she's just bragging or God just does things for her because she's a pastor. No, listen. When I was, uh, well, in, in uh, 98, 98, um, Pastor Mark and I had, had started trying to have a baby, but, you know, it's not anything we talked about because ain't nobody wants to think about it. Oh, do, 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 do. Okay, yeah, I get it. So, so nobody even knew we were trying, I guess is my point. And uh, so one day on my birthday, a lady in the church, she called me and she said, can you come? Uh, we were at church, and she called out to me, and she said, can you, can you come with me? And I said, well, sure. She said, I have to get something out of my car for you. And I said, okay. And all the way, we're, as we're walking out there in the A-frame church, she's apologizing. She's like, oh, Pastor Rhonda, I am so sorry. I was supposed to have this ready for tonight, and I am so sorry. It's not finished, but I, I still want to give it to you because it seems really important to God. And she said, I just want to give this to you. And, and she said, uh, she got, she, I got out to her car, and I'm like, girl, it's okay. You know, I don't, you know, I don't even know what she's talking about, you know. So she, she gets in her car, and she gets out a dedication dress for a baby girl. And she said, the Lord said, you're going to need this soon. Weeks I was pregnant. Weeks later I was pregnant with a little girl who wore that dedication dress that that woman handmade. God, what's my point? God made preparation for her life before she was. He made preparation for your life before you were. Listen, I realize some of you were born into bad situations. And I realize that some of you didn't have the growing up years that you would have wanted or that even, you know, some of them might have been even just barely tolerable. But I guarantee you, God made a path. He made a way. He saw ahead and made arrangements for someone to bring you the gospel so he could intervene and change your life. He got it to you by evidence of the fact that you're in this room. He laid out a good path for you. He's got things for you to do. Things that will fulfill you. Things that will make your heart sing. Don't settle for less. Don't settle for less. 
I, I'm like, oh, we had not even finished our scripture, but and it's after eight. Lord, help us. You now it reminds me of the story of the egg that appeared in the chicken yard. And the mama chicken looked at it, and she thought, that's a weird egg, but it's an egg. So she took the egg, and she sat on it and did whatever mama chickens do. And all of a sudden, it hatched one day, and it was the weirdest-looking chicken she'd ever seen. It didn't look like any of the other chickens. And obviously, this is a made-up story because I have no idea what mama chickens think and say, okay? <laughs> but all the other little chickens, they made fun of that chicken, because he didn't look like anybody else. He didn't fit in. You know, he, he, his proportions were off, and, and he looked funny, and uh, he just didn't look like everybody else, and he grew up thinking he was the worst chicken that ever was. I, I'm, just, I'm just, you know, a terrible chicken. I wish I could be a better chicken like everybody else is a better chicken. Then one day, after he grew up, he saw an eagle pass by above him in the sky. And he said, wait, it's like me. He was an eagle who had gone down in the chicken yard. The mama somehow had lost the egg or it rolled out of her nest or whatever happened. And that chicken grew up pecking the dirt and trying to get worms like the rest of the chicken and feeling bad about itself when really it was meant to soar on the winds and even the very breath of God. So many times we're down here pecking around in the dirt with the other chickens instead of soaring like the eagle God made you to be. Even if it looks like you don't look like everybody else, you don't fit in like everybody else, God made you unique for a specific purpose. His wings were wider and bigger because he was meant to soar. His beak didn't work well in the dirt, but it was only because it was meant to tear apart bigger creatures. His feet looked funny. His toes were too long because they were made to swoop down on prey. My point is, God's got better for you than you know. He, you were created for a destiny in God. You are his handiwork. Let's start it again, guys. So let's say it together. For I am God's own handiwork. His workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that I may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for me, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time, that I should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for me to live. Glory to God. If you meditate on that scripture for a while, it'll put some pep in your step. It'll put some wind beneath your wings. Amen. Glory to God. He has prearranged a good life for you. And you are his own handiwork, his own workmanship. Let's go to Psalms 139, verse 14. It says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. Are you able to rejoice in who he made you? Or are you still seeing yourself like the turkeys around you? Or the chickens? You are fearfully and wonderfully made. His works are wonderful in you. And do you know that full well? He has made all of us unique and different 
with different gifts and graces and strengths. You are his handiwork. Relax and just be the best you you can be. He has purpose and meaning for you beyond what you can even imagine. I told you last week about the title of a book, You Were Born an Original, Don't Die a Copy. We're born an original and then we spend the rest of our life trying to be like everybody else. No, you were born an original. Don't die a copy. 2 Corinthians 10, 12 out of the NIV. We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. How many of you know comparing yourself to anyone else is just foolish? Theodore Roosevelt, Roosevelt, Rose, Theodore Roosevelt said, Roosevelt, I don't know. Comparison is the thief of joy. Comparison is the thief of joy. Why is that? Because it gives us the wrong perspective. So much of what we see in the news media is not really real. I was going to say fake news, but I don't know if I could do it. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> oh, Lord, help me. I don't know where I am tonight. <laughs> but it's staged and retouched and cleaned up. How many of you know that that woman you see on the outside of that magazine, she don't always look like that. That picture's touched up. I, I have some proof. You guys ready? This is, the, this is the same picture. This is what she really looks like on the, on the left. That, that's how they fixed her up on the right. But you never see the left picture. They print the one on the right. Then we look at that and we think, man, she is flawless. No, they had a good airbrush. You understand? All right. Let's see what else we got. Oh, oh yeah, we know him, right? That's what he really looks like on the left. But on the right is the picture they published of him. After they retouched it, fixed it up, made him look better than he really is. Although, anyway, and moving on. <laughs> I know you. Do you want the mic? <laughs> it's not too late if you want to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. Okay. Uh, here's just another example. How many of you know she's a beautiful lady? Just the way she is. But the, but the one they print is just, is just picture perfect. But how many of you know that's not reality? We look at famous people like that and we think, if I could just look like that. But reality is they don't even look like that. Do you understand what I'm saying? And we can go to our Facebook page and see our friends. Lord, have mercy. I shouldn't tell this, but I have a teenager. And we're in the hotel room one night. And all of a sudden, her flash kept going off in the middle of the night. I said, what are you doing? And she's like, Instagram. She's taking pictures of herself in the dark. She can post with some pithy saying. I'm like, seriously? You know, but how many of you know... <laughs> Most pictures people post are staged. You ever got to a hotel room and it looked nothing like they, they put it online? I'm thinking, how did you find that angle to make this place look like it was a decent place to stay when it was really worn down, run through with stuff we don't want to talk about? I'm thinking, how in the world did you find just the right camera angle? They probably took their airbrush and, uh, anyway. <sighs> Reality is, a lot of time, Facebook and social media is just like the advertising we see on TV. It's self-advertising. I, I've never really been on Facebook, I have to be honest, but, but uh, I'm not on Facebook. Um, but, but I've never seen uh, or heard of anybody printing pictures of themselves that, that weren't just really good ones. I mean, nobody gets out of bed in the morning and their hair sticking straight up and they haven't brushed their teeth and they don't have any makeup on. How many of you know they wouldn't post that picture? 
So what do they post? The very, very best picture that they have of themselves. You know, get all the angles. I've seen them. When we were at the beach, Pastor Mark nearly took this lady out because she was looking at her phone. She was doing her own, you know, she walked right in front of us. Oh, golly, not worth dying over, y'all. To get, I got to get just the right angle, you know. Here, look, maybe it's better like this. You know, I mean, they might spend 30 minutes taking shots till they find the one they want to post. It's self-advertising. My, my, my point is people only post what is the best of them. It's self-advertising. But we can look at it and think, everybody else is doing so much better than I am. They look so much better than I do. Their family looks so much happier than mine. They say for every 10 minutes you're on social media, your happiness level goes down because of the comparison factor. While social media does do some good things in people's lives, there's a lot of studies out now that say social media actually robs value from our lives. We feel like we're connecting with people when really we're just reading. I worry about this generation, they, that they, do they even know how to communicate with each other. You know, I had a friend who said uh, sh- there was a girl staying in her home, and they were in bedrooms, and there was like one wall separating them, and they were talking on Facebook. Walk out in the hall and say Hello. And sometimes it makes us feel like if, if I was what I'm not, I would be happy. Did you hear me? If I was what I'm not, I would be happy. Or if I just had what I don't have, I would be happy. But how many of you know that's not true? Happiness isn't found in any of those things. Jim Carrey, the actor, said, and I'm just quoting him, and just shut up, Rhonda. Keep moving. I think, uh, he said, I think everybody should get rich and famous just so they can see that it's not the answer. I think what he meant is everybody chases money and success and fame thinking it will bring them happiness, but it doesn't. We can look at the lives, uh, uh, at the caricature of other people's lives and don't realize that it's just that, a caricature. Why do you think so many famous actors and wealthy people do drugs and go from failed relationship to failed relationship? Because they got it. They chased. It's it's like a dog chasing a car. What's that dog going to do when it catches it? They caught the car. They've got the money. They've got the boat. They've got the Ferrari. And they're miserable still. Because there's not happiness or contentment in any of that. You have to find it in God. They're looking in all the wrong places for fulfillment. They think, as we sometimes do, that if I could only arrive at success or financial freedom or whatever, that I'd be happy only to get there and find out that their lives are just as empty and hollow as they were before they had money and fame. Maybe worse because now they don't have that hope that if I get there, I'll be better. Happiness and fulfillment are only found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and letting him tell you who you truly are. Let's read our scripture again, 2 Corinthians 10, 12. We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. How many of you know when it comes to our callings and the plan of God in our lives, we have to be careful not to look longingly at what other people have achieved? 
Comparison can evoke wrong feelings of envy or jealousy. How many of you know another person's success is no threat or challenge to our success? When we are happy and content and running our race, then we can celebrate other people's successes. Because you're a success too. Because you're a success the minute you decided to obey God. You're a success the minute you started out on this journey following him. Everybody else's success. We can be happy for them. I can be happy for you because your success doesn't diminish mine. So many times we feel like we have to blow somebody else's light out so people will see ours. I have to diminish them so people will see me. No, man. When you start feeling that way, you know what? That is one of those idiot lights on your dashboard. You know, ding, 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 ding. You're out of gas. Knuckle ahead. We call them idiot lights in our house. It's probably not very nice, but. Envy, according to the dictionary, is painful or resentful awareness of an advantage enjoyed by another joined with a desire to possess that same advantage. Painful, resentful desire for somebody else's possessions or advantages. It's so very destructive to our lives. Listen, Proverbs 14, 30 says, A heart at peace gives life to the body. But envy rots the bones. James 3.13 out of the NIV. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it is earthly, unspiritual, of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. The King James Version of that verse says, where there is envy and strife, there is confusion and every evil work. How many of you know you're never going to be happy tearing everybody else down? Because there's always going to be somebody else doing better than you. That's why comparing yourselves among yourselves is foolish. It's like when you first learn to drive and you want to get to the head of the line. Right? Teenagers sometimes, especially, well, anyway, I won't say especially who. <clears throat> but teenagers sometimes, you know, they're driving and there's a line of cars and they think, I want to be at the front. So they drive really fast. How many of you know there ain't no front? <laughs> people are getting on, people are getting off. There, there's no front to get to. That's the same as you trying to knock everybody else out so you can look good. There is no front. There's just more people coming and going. We can rejoice with people at their success because their success doesn't diminish me. It doesn't keep me from my success. We can both be successful. What is the root of envy? The Lord told me today, the root of envy is fear. Fear that I will never have. Or fear that I will never be. In fact, that very thing has spawned a new acronym. Go ahead and put it up there, guys. FOMO. Who knows what FOMO means? Two. Three, fear, four, fear of missing out. How many of you know there's so many people 
who, who now live their life trying to compete with all these false images of everybody else's life because they're afraid they're going to miss something. Afraid somebody's going to have something they don't have or, or somebody's going to do better than they do or somebody's going to uh, be more prosperous than they are or, or look more successful than they do. It's fear-based. Envy is fear-based. But I'm here to tell you tonight, we don't have to be envious of anybody for any reason because God is not a withholder. He is a good father and he is for you and he can make you everything that you desire to be. He can get you everything that you desire to have. Why should I be envious even if I'm believing for something and you get it before me? I'm not... All that means is I'm in that same line of blessing. The God who did that for you, he'll do it for me because I serve the same God you do, and I'm in that same line of blessing. Yeah, you might have been ahead of me a few steps, but baby, I'm coming up right behind you, and I'm going to get mine. And because I can get mine, I'm rejoicing with you that you got yours. Listen. I've been believing God for stuff. Sometimes even things I believed God for for years. But I could still rejoice when somebody else got it without effort and no time passing. Because my father did that. And my father who did it for you will do it for me. I'm in that same line of blessing. God would not put a dream in your heart that he didn't uh, intend to fulfill. Psalms 84, 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. No good thing. No good thing does he withhold. You remember we talked last week uh, about, you know, how jealous David's brothers were of him. And they were jealous because when God lined them all up, the prophet stood in front of each one of them and said, not you, not you, not you, until they got down to the runt of the litter. When he stood in front of the first son, he was tall and handsome, and he looked kingly. And the, and the prophet said, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. But God said, do not consider his outward appearance, for I have looked on the heart. And I have rejected him because of his heart. How many of you know Eliab, the oldest boy, his heart and the condition of it was up to him? If you, if your ways, if you please God, if your heart is right towards him, he can position you in places and do things for you that will freak people's minds. He'll open doors for you. He'll set you in places. He'll show you 20 dolphins when there hadn't been one in two years. He is not a withholder. He is a blesser. But it depends a lot on the condition of our heart. And that is something we can control. You know what? That makes God the great equalizer. He is not a respecter of persons. He's a respecter of faith. Fear is an indicator that you're not in faith. Therefore, envy is an indicator that you're not in faith for what God said. Because the basis for envy is fear. But that's an adjustment you can make. That's an adjustment you can make. If God said I can, then I can. 
I don't care what it looks like. I don't care how many times my family said I was stupid and I couldn't do anything right and I was going to end up in, in prison like Uncle Albert. And, and, you know, my mama was never worth nothing. My dear daddy was never worth nothing. You're never going to be worth nothing. How many of you know nobody can keep you down? Nobody can keep you down when God lifts you up. Oh, I want to jump to the end. I may have to. I, if I believe that God planted this dream in my heart, and I know that he's not a man that he should lie, then what should I fear and of whom should I be envious? When we realize what a great God we serve, envy is out the door because you can get anywhere from the cross. You got to go to the cross first. And receive him. And give him your life. But once you get to that cross, baby, he can get you anywhere from there. It's like the great crossroads in, in the sky. He can get you anywhere from there. It doesn't matter whether you were born on the wrong side of the tracks. It doesn't matter whether you were uh, raised in a cardboard box or whether you were raised in a mansion. God can take you anywhere from the cross. He's the great equalizer. Psalms 113 verse 7. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill that he may set him with princes, even the princes of his people. It doesn't matter anything except that you came to the cross. The cross is the great equalizer. Once you get to the cross, he can take you anywhere. Look, I realize it's easier to sit back and tear everybody else down who's successful. It's so much easier to tear them down than to get out and get after it yourself. But stop looking around you and focusing on everybody else's life and start living your own You don't have to try and steal somebody else's life and success. If you trust him, he'll give you your own life and your own success. You don't have to diminish somebody else to put yourself forward. You have a destiny in God. You were created for a purpose, and it's time to get after it. God needs you in your place in this hour in the body of Christ. He needs you to get in your place and let him live big through you. It's time for you to be a walking, talking billboard and advertisement of the goodness of God. Zechariah 4.10 in the NIV who despises the day of small beginnings? Men will rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. I like it in the New Living. Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. The Lord said, do not despise these small beginnings. To you, it may look like nothing. You know, you ever looked at somebody who was achieving great things and you're called to do something similar and you think, man, they're so far. They're, they're so much greater than me. What is this little bit that you've given me compared to what they have? You know, Pastor Mark and I were privileged to go to Rama and sit at the feet of many great ministers. I mean, Brother Hagen came there. Kenneth Copeland came there. Keith Moore was one of our instructors. Patsy Caminetti was one of our instructors. And how many of you know what you have can look like God gave you a teaspoon when he gave them a, 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 a gallon? And you think, Lord, what do I have in comparison to what they have? But what did we just say? You ought not be comparing anyway. Get after it. Everybody started small. Everybody started somewhere. 
And the greatness that they became came because they took that first step. And they were not afraid to start small. They were not afraid to struggle. I have seen ministers who failed because they were afraid to struggle. Sometimes that struggling to get out of the egg is what makes the chick strong. I was poor as Job's turkey at Ramah. I'm just not even kidding. I had one, one week I had $2 for groceries and nothing in the house. I went to the grocery store and I bought the cheapest pack of hot dogs I could find. It was 88 cents. And I went to the bread store and I found day old bread that they had taken off the shelf and had on the special rack. And for a week, I lived on one pack of hot dogs and one loaf of bread. And if my mama was here, she'd be crying because she's mad at me to this day for not telling her. But I said, I have got to figure out faith for finances. I knew in my heart God was going to send me to the world. And I knew I had to figure it out. And if I had to struggle, so be it. If I went hungry a night or two, it wasn't going to be the end of the world. But I was going to figure it out. And I did. And I did. Glory to God. We can't despise the day of small beginnings. Put that scripture back up there in the New Living. Do not despise these small beginnings. For the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Glory to God. I've gotten credit for obedience the moment I made up my mind to obey. Sometimes God will bless you on credit. Just when you make up your mind that you're going to obey. He's blessed me before I ever got to what he told me to do. Because I told him, sir, I really will do it. And he knew I meant it. He gets excited to see the work begin. Once you get after the plan, once you get after the dream he's put in your heart, it makes the heart of God excited because he knows what's coming. It may not look like anything right now. It may look insignificant. You may look like you're the least likely to do anything, but you can do it if he said you can do it. Start. Don't be afraid of the struggle. Don't be afraid of the days of small beginnings. Sometimes that's what it takes to figure stuff out. How many of you know, after about a week, I was serious about figuring it out. Once I graduated Rama, I couldn't eat hot dogs for decades. I don't even like hot dogs. But it was cheap, and there was eight of them in a package. But I figured it out. You can get anywhere from the cross. If you attend your heart and serve him and believe that he can do what he said he could do with you. We see ourselves after the flesh. He sees us when his spirit comes upon us and empowers us. Give him your natural and he'll blow his super on it. And you'll achieve great things for God.